fearfully plausible that America could go to war with China over Taiwan. That is according to a former Defense Department official. Taiwan is now threatening to respond with military force if China's armed forces breach its territorial waters or airspace. George Thomas explains the grave danger behind these soaring tensions. China expert Gordon Chang claims Beijing is gearing up for war. A Chinese entrepreneur, factory owner, a few weeks ago told me that uh, local cadres, officials, came up to him and said he's no longer producing medical equipment for civilians. His factory is going to be converted to war production. And this was not just an isolated case. Elbridge Colby, a former top Defense Department official, warns America should prepare for war with China over Taiwan, warning that a conflict has gone from a remote scenario to a fearfully plausible one. Gordon Chang says Beijing is already making preparations. And the Chinese uh, Communist Party is trying to sanctions proof itself. So, for instance, it has told its officials to sell their foreign assets so they can't be taken away by foreign governments if they wanted to impose costs on China for invasion. This as tensions continue to soar in the Taiwan Strait. On Tuesday, for the first time, Taiwan fired at Chinese drones buzzing the Kinmen Island just miles from China's coastline, vowing further counterattacks if Chinese provocations continue. We will assess threat level and determine whether to engage the targets and exercise the rights of self-defense. And that includes Taiwan pumping more money into its defense budget. That's already a record $19 billion this year. While Beijing continues to claim sovereignty over the island, Taiwan's president, visiting a military base near China's coastline this week, urged soldiers to keep their cool in the face of growing threats. I want to tell you that the more provocative the enemy is, the more calm we need to be. We won't allow those on the opposing banks to manufacture a conflict with an inappropriate excuse. China has kept up this military pressure since Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taipei early this month, with almost daily warplane flights and warship maneuvers in the Taiwan Strait. They are um, practicing for war. And we saw that with the live fire exclusion zones, which were imposed after Speaker Pelosi's visit. Um, God knows what they have up their sleeve in, in Beijing. Taiwan's military, by the way, said it shot down a drone today that was buzzing over the same area where the Chinese drones were flying earlier in the week. Meanwhile, with the growing fears that China is preparing to take Taiwan by military force, the Biden administration is reportedly planning to ask Congress to approve more than a billion dollars in arms sales to Taiwan, including anti-tank missiles, surveillance radar technology, and tactical air-to-air -air missiles. Andrew? George, what's your take? I think Americans want to know, would the U.S. really enter into a military conflict with China over Taiwan? And secondly, are we obligated in some way to do so? Well, let me answer the second question. Uh, yes, we are uh, obligated. Why? Because under uh, the Taiwan Relations Act, which was uh, signed, Andrew, uh, 43 years ago, uh, it says that while the U.S. will not uh, militarily intervene, should China, for example, uh, uh, invade uh, Taiwan, instead the U.S. has a commitment, has has an obligation uh, to make available what they say such defense articles and defense services uh, to Taiwan in essence to allow them to uh, defend uh, their island nation but what is more important uh, in in sort of in light of the escalating tensions uh, in the Taiwan Strait in a couple of days the Senate relations uh, uh, committee is going to bring up some very very important uh, legislation that would in essence upgrade the 19 uh, uh, the, the 43 the the, the the, the thing that was signed 43 years ago uh, to upgrade it and in essence be more specific, Andrew, that would commit some very serious military hardware to the Taiwanese uh, to protect themselves. Again, just another indication of the challenges that we are facing. Yeah, and just shifting the focus a little bit here, the, the UN Human Rights Commission released a report detailing really serious human rights violations against Uyghur Muslims. How serious are these violations they found? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it uh, in essence echoes, it corroborates 
what uh, human rights groups have been talking about, Andrew, for several years. And the fact that this, the world's largest human rights body has come out, in essence, uh, corroborating what uh, the evidence has shown over the last few years. And that evidence is that uh, China has been committing war crimes uh, against crimes against humanity, rather against the so-called Uyghur Muslims and other ethnic minorities. The key question now is that now that the UN has released this very important document, uh, what will the uh, other UN uh, bodies, the other countries that are signatories to the United Nations, what will they do? And that is what everybody and the United Nations, as well as the human rights groups, are looking forward to. All right, George, certainly appreciate your reporting. Thanks for being with us sure. today. You're welcome. In other news, the water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi, is entering its third day. Ephraim Graham has that story and much more from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim. Andrew, more than 150,000 people are still without clean drinking water after a pump failure at the city's main treatment plant. We can't drink it, we can't cook in it, and I'm scared to bathe in it. Thousands of residents are waiting in lines for bottled water. Schools are closed with students now in virtual learning. And hotels and restaurants are seeing a deep decline in business. The city installed a new pump, but restoring full water pressure is slow going. The mayor is optimistic service will be restored within the week. The FDA granted emergency authorization for the next round of COVID booster shots. They're aimed at protecting against the BA4 and BA5 subvariants of the Omicron strain, which make up 99% of all new cases. The FDA not waiting for clinical trials on the booster, citing confidence in previous mRNA vaccines. They're hoping the shots will last through the winter. Here um, is not to have to give lots of vaccines each year. It's hopefully to have this be the vaccine that holds us uh, for as much of this or for the entire season, if it can. The Pfizer shots are authorized for those 12 and older. Moderna for those 18 and older. If the CDC gives its approval, the shot should be available after Labor Day. The Supreme Court decision overturning Roe versus Wade is still having ripple effects across America. Some pro-life supporters see needs to fill when it comes to supporting families. Members of Congress are working on a plan they believe would do just that. But it could be a tough sell to conservatives. CBN News Capitol Hill correspondent Matt Galka explains. The initial reaction to the Supreme Court decision returning abortion to the states was that it would mean momentum for stronger pro-life legislation. It's also served as a catalyst for an idea not necessarily embraced by some conservatives. While the reversal of Roe versus Wade was seen as an obvious win for pro-lifers, it also meant the beginning of another battle. It resulted in a flurry of activity from House Democrats, passing mostly symbolic bills that are stalled in the Senate to codify abortion into federal law. Democrats are putting people over politics. We are ferociously defending the right to make decisions about women's health. Some Republicans argue it's time for more family support. Utah Senator Mitt Romney put out his Family Security Act 2.0 plan over the summer. It's meant to ease economic hardships on families. Finances are often the number one reason cited by women seeking an abortion. Romney has tried to thread the needle between support and what could be perceived as welfare in the bill. I'd like people, a, a young woman that's not working and is pregnant, I'd like her to know that she doesn't um, have to eliminate the pregnancy to be able to uh, carry uh, uh, the financial burden of a child. But, uh, but I understand that we don't want to create an, a, a, any potential incentive for people to become entirely dependent upon government. For more than a decade, economist Abby McCloskey has advocated for a greater government response to the struggles families and single mothers face. There has been hesitation, I think, on the part of conservatives to rally behind these policies um, to the extent they're seen as a new entitlement or new spending and new federal overreach. And, you know, as a conservative, those concerns are ones I take seriously as well. Um, that said, I think the purpose of government, even for the most conservative of us, is to provide a safety net for vulnerable people. Romney's plan has also earned some support from major pro-life advocates, including the National Right to Life Committee. The practical effect, of course, is going to help families with young children, but also hopefully it is going to help to make women realize that children are a blessing and um, ending the life of that child is not going to improve their life. 
Now, Romney's plan isn't the only GOP effort here. Florida Senator Marco Rubio has sponsored a plan that also includes a tax credit, plus expands in areas like paid leave, adoption, and crisis pregnancy centers. You can read more about both plans on CBNNews.com. Matt Gelka, CBN News. The need even more critical as we see everything rising in cost. Andrew? Yeah, thank you, Matt, for your report. And as you heard in his in his story, economic challenges are a primary reason a lot of mothers give for wanting to terminate the pregnancy. And maybe as a result of this initiative, many lives will be saved. Want to let you know also, for those of you who have called and written us to check on Gordon, thank you for your concern and care for him. He'll be back next week. Just want to let you know he had taken some time off. We had told you this a few times over the course of these weeks. He has been out, but he is doing well. He'll be with us next week, and he is doing just fine. So thanks for your calls. Well, what you're about to see is not your usual church service. It's not even your usual live stream service. The pandemic forced many to think out of the box and into the metaverse. And John Jessup brings us this story. You've probably heard about the metaverse, but what is it and how do you get there? We're about to show you how it all works using a setting you're probably familiar with. We're going to church unlike you've ever seen it before. It may look like animation, but the characters on your screen aren't cartoon pixels playing church. They represent real people worshiping in the world of virtual reality. Bless everyone here with whatever they're going through. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is church in the metaverse, where users in the real world wear VR headsets to guide their avatar selves into a simulated immersive experience. And it's gaining interest among the curious and the faithful. We found that the environment was just a rich environment for ministry. Oklahoma-based Life Church now has a campus in the metaverse to add to its 40 other locations. We always say if we're going to reach people that no one else is reaching, we're going to have to do some things that no one else is doing. That is really just more of our DNA in general and that when there's new technologies and new platforms and all the new attention that the metaverse is getting today, we want to be present and we want to learn and understand how we can do ministry in it. Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just got to find something to wear. Facebook's dive into the digital dimension helped it gain attraction and legitimacy with major players from gaming. Some call it skill. Fashion. Welcome semblance, the fashion's entry to the metaverse. And even healthcare lining up to unleash its potential. Last year, people dropped more than $500 million to get a piece of the metaverse's real estate. While some see it as a revenue generator, a growing number of faith leaders believe it's just just another platform to promote the gospel. There has been this shift of this kind of like fringe technology, fringe um, experience that's now starting to become mainstream. DJ Soto launched VR Church in 2016 and predicts a place in the metaverse will soon become just as common as a church's website and social media are today. By 2030, uh, your main experience for your church will be in the metaverse. He points to another major benefit. When you start to experience church in the metaverse, you start to see this whole world of forgotten people who want to be part of the spiritual community, but maybe they don't have a way or a, a way to be connected to one. That's what hit home for Alina Delp. For probably the first couple, two or three services, I just cried. A former flight attendant and thrill seeker She's been confined to her home due to a rare neurovascular condition. For her, streaming had its limitations. You could watch others be part of the church, but you couldn't be part of the church. And if anything, that just saddened me. Discovering VR Church gave her a sense of community, initially volunteering as a greeter, then leading a small group. After enrolling in seminary, Alina is now part of the pastoral team, ministering to people from all over the world and from all walks of life. In VR, people are very open about where they are. There's not the facade. They don't put on their, their Sunday best and pretend that, that everybody's a grade A student and life is wonderful. And, um, but they're really honest about what's happening in their lives, um, which allows us to pastor better. Skeptics question everything from safety in the virtual reality movement to sound theology to justify its use. Pastor Bobby Grunwald, who developed the YouVersion Bible app, 
believes the debate over virtual versus physical boils down to reaching people where they are. We are for meeting in buildings. We're big proponents of it. We have a multi-site church. We meet in, in 39 different locations physically. We're part of local communities. But we also feel like we have these tools available today that have never been available before in human history that allow us and give us the opportunity to connect and reach people that we otherwise would not be able to reach. Soto counters that the metaverse is smart use of technology, like when the late Billy Graham went on radio and TV to evangelize the masses. We're connecting with people digitally, virtually, over airways, if you will, and the relationships and the community and the connections, the salvation and the discipleship is just as powerful as anything that we've seen in the past. For Life Church, church in the metaverse isn't about choosing the physical over the virtual. It's about the mandate to reach people with the gospel and one of their mantras, which is to do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ and to reach people no one is reaching will have to do things no one is doing. John Jessup, CBN News, Oklahoma City. Well, I'm sure for many of you, like me, you see that story and you think this has been unusual and strange and maybe unfortunate and not the direction we're hoping the church goes. And I get that. It's my hope that people will find the church in the United States to be a warm and welcoming and loving and place filled with grace. And they will desire to visit our houses of worship and experience the love of the gospel. In the meantime, you know, Jesus said, we will receive power in Acts 1-8 to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And while I don't think that's necessarily the intention of the church in America, those pastors are bringing the gospel to an unreached group, and hopefully they can come into the fold as a result of experiencing that. So let's pray for those who are going to church in that way and pray that they'll want to desire to feel the love of Christ in a gathered assembly. Mm -hmm. Terry. Well, Ryan had only gone skiing twice when he decided to try a jump. He figured, how hard can it be? Well, he soon found out his body folded over in the air and landed with such force that his back muscles detached from his spinal column. January 27th, 2019. High school senior Ryan Kolonich was enjoying a day on the slopes with his ski club in Somerset, Pennsylvania. And then I, uh, I was the last one to go down of the friend group, and I was going a little too fast. <laughs> too fast for the small ski jump he went over. Ryan crashed hard. His next memory was waking up stunned and surrounded by the ski patrol. Before long, he was being loaded onto a helicopter headed toward the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, strapped to a backboard, unable to move. I was scared. I was panicked. By then, it had really sunken in that, like, I can't feel anything below my waist. I was just thinking, like, am I ever going to walk again? That was the only question on my mind. Meanwhile, the trip chaperone had called Ryan's parents, Jen and Rick, now making the two-hour drive to Pittsburgh from their home in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I was just terrified. I didn't know, I still didn't know what happened to him. I just wanted him to be all right. By the time they arrived, other family members were already there. He still had his head strapped down, his you know, the sea collar on, and his arms and legs were strapped down. And he just started crying as soon as he saw us. You could see the pain in her eyes. You could see my dad's, my uncle's, my grandpa's. You could see their fear. And we, we prayed, because that's all we, 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 we thought we could do. Prayed and waited. I got overwhelmed with emotion. It's just awful seeing your kid in that state. That's when I started praying even harder as just constant prayer. An MRI revealed Ryan's L1 vertebrae had been shattered and bone shards were pinching his spinal cord. Immediately, doctors scheduled him for surgery, saying even if it was successful, Ryan may never walk again. He's only 18. He shouldn't have to worry about these things about whether he's gonna be able to function in life anymore. The Koloniches reached out to everyone they could think of asking for prayer. I called my dad right away. So I was crying like a baby. I was, I was like, Ryan's hurt so, so bad. It was very difficult. In the four hour surgery, doctors successfully removed the bone shards and stabilized Ryan's spinal cord using two rods and 10 screws. It was then doctors began performing daily tests to determine if Ryan could feel any sensation in his legs or feet. 
they also asked him to wiggle his toes. For three days, nothing happened until finally. I was able to get my one toe to like just twitch. Seeing a little bit of movement, I was extremely happy. That was a good sign. And it was amazing, all these little blessings that you see happening along his path to recovery. Even though Ryan continued to improve, it was slow, and his doctor couldn't offer much hope. I asked him, you know, I'm like, hey, am I ever going to walk again? I, I remember him being like, I can't promise you anything. I, you know, I can't promise you're even going to stand again. And then something s sort of switched, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to give it my all. At the end of February, two weeks after surgery, Ryan checked in at the hospital's rehab facility. I was praying, but I was, I was almost talking, just talking to God. Ryan worked hard over the next month as each day brought small victories. He was eventually able to stand using the parallel bars. Then, on his last day in the facility with his therapist urging him on and his mom waiting at the end of the bars, I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying and I can't get, but then out and I was able to just get it to like slide. He walked to me at the end of the parallel bars. Oh, he's crying. We were both just crying. I was so happy. He's like, I did it. I walked. After going home, Ryan continued his daily PT sessions. Now he had another goal, walk the stage at graduation under his own power. I knew that if God could get me to where I was, there was nothing that could stop me. Then at graduation on June 7th, 2019, the cheers of his family and the crowd pushing him on, Ryan walked across the stage on his own to accept his diploma. Just to see him be able to do that, and accomplish a goal he had in mind, and he did it all on his own. It was unbelievable. I was so proud. He said he was going to do it, and then he did it. It was just such a great moment. With the support of orthopedic braces, Ryan is still walking. Now attending college and making plans for his future, he's taking every day one step at a time, knowing the Lord is always there alongside him. God listened. I would have be here doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for him. Like, there's no way. We're just blessed that he's able to walk. Realizing the miracle just to be able to walk, period, was more than a blessing. Through prayer, anything's possible. I have a constant reminder of what I've been through. And that reminder just helps enforce, like, how great God is. He is great. Scripture says, he is the Lord, our healer, and that certainly was true in Ryan's situation as he continues to just move forward and progress. Took a lot of effort on his part to do it as well, but that healing happened because the hand of God touched his spine and his knee and his muscles and ligaments and all the things involved. You see, God knows all the details. We want to pray for you today. We know many of you are struggling with various needs of your own. Here's someone, this is Jeannie. She wrote to us by email and said, I was watching a YouTube replay of the August 26th broadcast when they prayed for someone with a painful shoulder. My shoulder and arm have been hurting. I wasn't able to lift my arm. I couldn't reach for anything above my shoulder. I claimed this healing and immediately, immediately the pain was gone and I could lift my arm. Thank you for your prayers. I just want to point out that this was a rebroadcast. You know, she's watching this at a later date. Yeah. God is not trapped mm -hmm. in time. You know, his, his ability to do things is on his timetable, Amen. not ours. I mean, here's one more. Judy of Colorado Springs, Colorado was told by her ENT doctor that she had polyps in her nose that required surgery. While watching the 700 Club recently, she heard Terry say, there is someone with polyps in her nose and they are gone. Judy claimed the word of knowledge for herself. Two weeks later, she went to see her doctor, which we love to hear, we advise that. She went to see her doctor. And after he checked with her, he told her that her polyps were gone. She told him of her miracles. She is praising God. Hey, listen, before we pray, I just want to mention something I was reading in scripture. I believe it's Acts 12, okay? I want us to pray with expectation. Peter was in prison. Right? And the church, people were praying for Peter's release from prison. It, the Bible is specifically clear. They were praying for him. They believed in the power of prayer. And an angel visits Peter in prison where he's guarded by 16 soldiers, and the angel facilitates him out of that prison cell, leads him out. Peter is free. 
So Peter goes to where those folks are praying to tell them the good news, knocks on the door, and a servant girl, girl, Rhoda, answers. And she hears Peter's voice, is so excited, doesn't even answer the door. She goes and tells the folks, he's here. Our prayers are answered. And they told her, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Finally, Peter is let in, and they see their prayer answered. But here they were praying earnestly for Peter, but they were surprised when the answer came. Let's pray with expectation, knowing God hears us. Let's not be surprised when the Lord does his work that we're seeking. We are, we are just people here before the Lord who loves us, and we're saying, God, we believe. We believe. We pray with expectation. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for examples in Scripture of how people sought you. They came to you, and they expressed their need, Lord, and you responded. And let us not be astonished today by what you do. You're doing a new thing. I think it's Isaiah 43. You're doing a new thing. Can we not perceive it? You're making a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert, Father. We thank you, Lord God. There, there is somebody, I think it's a young person, and you're being bullied, I believe, for your faith, for your stance for God, and your peers are coming against you hard, and you're heartbroken, and you're feeling lonely, and you're feeling like, is it worth living for Christ? And he just says, yes. Yes, I am worth it. I am jealous for you. I am with you through this. Keep hold of my hand, soldier. He has you. Yeah, there's somebody, you, um, you have a problem with your aorta just some, that's created some general heart issues. You've had it for many, many years. I mean, you just kind of have decided to deal, to just accept it. God's healing that condition for you right now. Just put your hand over that area of your body and raise your other hand. Pray expectantly, accepting what God has done for you today in Jesus' name. Yeah, and as Terry's talking about praying expectantly, there, there's someone who's feeling like they don't have the faith mm. for a miracle. The power is in Jesus. The power is in the Holy Spirit of God. The power is in our loving Father. That's where the power is. Do you have a mustard seed faith? Bring it before the Lord now in Jesus' name. There's someone who's got a, like a, a shivering in your body. It's like you're freezing, but you're not necessarily cold. I don't know if it's fear that's come upon you, but the Lord's releasing you of that today in Jesus' name. And you're just going to be delighted at this peace. You're going to just have peace. It's not going to be a feeling, but you're going to be delivered of that now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And someone else, you have particles from something in your lungs. I have no idea what that is or how you got it, but it's damaging to your lungs. And uh, no one's quite sure how to get rid of that. God's healing your lungs right now in every way, strengthening them. Just breathe in deeply and receive that, that breath of life from Yahweh. Just accept it and begin to praise Him. I just feel like Jesus wants to take a burden off people's neck. Like He said, His, oh, Lord, thank you that you love us. It's not about our performance. Your burden is easy, Lord. You love us. Someone needs to hear today, it's not about your performance for the Lord. It's not about what others think of you or your performance for others. Jesus just wants you to walk in fellowship with him. Just walk in simple fellowship with him and experience his love. He wants to communicate with you and speak with you and give you more of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, I just pray today, people who want more of the Holy Spirit in their life, just raise your hands now and he will fill you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And Lord, I just want to pray as we close for people that are in bondage to addiction. I don't know if it's alcohol or drugs, but it's controlling their life. And Lord God, today we just break those bonds. The way we talked about how Peter was, his chains dropped off his wrists. And Lord, we pray that now the chains are broken by the power of God. We don't need an angel to visit us in our room. Yes. We thank you. The Holy Spirit can intercede now, and those chains are broken. Whatever has caused bondage to addiction, you're breaking that now as we pursue righteousness in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing and what you'll continue to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as always, we would love to hear from you. Perhaps you've experienced a miracle. Perhaps you have had prayers answered, we want to hear from you. Perhaps you need more prayer. 800-700-7000, there is someone to pray for you or just simply receive your call. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. 
The California State Senate passed a bill making it a sanctuary state for children seeking transgender medical treatment, even without their parents' permission. The bill authorizes California courts to take temporary emergency jurisdiction over out-of-state minors. It would make California a legal destination for children who want to make their sex changes permanent and potentially a gateway for out-of-state children to receive hormones, puberty blockers, and even surgery. The bill now goes to Governor Gavin Newsom for his signature. I want to turn now to a special election in Alaska where former governor and Republican vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin was defeated in her bid for Congress. Democrat Mary Peltola was declared the winner of the election that was held August 16th. The delay in the results was because of counting absentee ballots from outside the U.S. It was Alaska's first statewide election using a process called ranked choice voting, which allows voters to pick up to four candidates and rank their preferences. Palin called the system crazy, convoluted, and confusing. Want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Violent shaking, furniture and TVs falling over, glass shattering. When a 7.1 magnitude earthquake hit their house, Melvin and Carrie were traumatized. Later, as they picked through the rubble, the couple discovered the full extent of the damage. Melvin and Carrie are enjoying retirement in beautiful Alaska. Both served in the U.S. Army. Mel served four and a half years, while Carrie went on to serve 20. I'm proud of her, proud of the 20 years that she served, and she was a great soldier at work and at home. Their peaceful lives were disrupted when a 7.1 magnitude earthquake hit Anchorage. The epicenter was only a few miles from their home. It felt like someone picked up our house and was just shaking it violently. Everything in the, in the house just began to fall, TVs, dressers, glass shattering. Uh, it, was, it was pretty traumatic. As Melvin and Carrie picked through what was left of their belongings, they were alarmed at the extent of damage to the structure of their home. I knew it was bad, but when I start going room by room to seeing, I mean, cracks in the ceiling, cracks on the walls, cracks in the garage. I looked at all the cracks and I'm like, this was really bad. The couple faced another blow when they learned that their homeowner's insurance policy covered some, but not all of the repairs. Once tallied up, they had nearly $16,000 of out-of-pocket expenses, money they didn't have. Rather than go into debt, they decided to live with the damage. I would love to fix it, but there's really nothing that we can do at this point. We're not on a timetable because we don't have the resources to do it. After hearing about Mel and Carrie's financial challenges, New Season Church in Anchorage asked helping the home front to provide support. We contacted Home Depot and asked if they wanted to join us in assisting the couple. We're super excited with the partnership with CBN. It's, it's been an awesome roller coaster because we've been excited for this family and wanting to give back to them and, and we just want to do what we do best. Pastor Tommy Leonard told the couple the big news. CBN is going to take care of all your contractors and make sure that your home is made whole. What do you guys think about that? Oh, God. That God is faithful. Amen. Amen. There's more. Home Depot has donated all of the supplies needed in order to paint your home, your cabinets, your doors. Wow. And today, we are going to Home Depot. There's a team of people waiting to be there to help serve you and meet the need of making sure that your house is fully complete. <laughs> this, this is too much, yeah. Wow. We had a conversation. I don't know how he's gonna do it. Yes. But we know he's gonna do it. Praise God. Hallelujah! Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Yes. Sir, thank you so much. Thank you. They headed to Home Depot where a team greeted them and helped the couple begin the process of getting their home back to normal. Contractors went to work and soon Melvin and Carrie's home was completely restored. It's beyond my wildest dreams. I could have never imagined that something like this would happen. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed and, and overjoyed <laughs> because this is amazing. 
it moves you to tears, doesn't it, to see people who are in such desperate need, and then out of the blue, God brings hope, and that hope is you. If you're a 700 Club member, you would be right in line with all those Home Depot people standing there helping this couple restore what was taken from them. Listen, you're doing that all the time, not just with our military. What a privilege it is to be able to help them, but you're doing it all around the world, and it happens every day. Join the 700 Club because you really can make a difference in powerful ways in people's lives. And you get to carry that light of hope into the midst of somebody's desperation. And what a privilege that is. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. But there are lots of options for you. Maybe you're already a general member. Then would you consider going up to the 700 Club Gold level? That's a gift of $40 a month. Or joining the 1,000 Club at $84 a month. Our 2,500 Club members join us at $209 a month. Or you could become a founder, $417 a month. That works out to $5,000 a year. What an opportunity you and I have to make a difference. And we get to do it together. You know, God's put us in family so that we could have a powerful impact. You do all of this by calling our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. When you do, our way of saying thank you for caring about others is to send you Pat's latest teaching. It's a CD, Putting on the Armor of God, a teaching from the book of Ephesians. And we think it will touch your life in a powerful way. And at the same time, you'll be changing someone else's. So call now. Andrew? Well, throughout the Bible, the scriptures warn about people turning away from the true God to serve new ones. The book of Psalms calls this form of idolatry a trap. According to Jonathan Kahn, these guys are still around and they've invaded this country. Is it possible that behind the events transforming our culture, our nation, and your life is a mystery that goes back to ancient times? In his most explosive book ever, The Return of the Gods, New York Times bestselling author Jonathan Kahn pulls away the veil and reveals these shocking secrets. Uncover the mystery of the gods and how it's transforming your life. The Return of the Gods. All right, Jonathan Kahn joins us now via Skype. Jonathan, welcome back to the program. Always love having you. Hey, Andrew, great to be here. You refer to these gods as the Dark Trinity. Who are they, and where did they come from? Okay, yeah, to to just kind of give a, a quick overview, and that is that that this is definitely the most explosive book I've ever written, and that is the the, the ultimate thing is it's affecting every one of our lives. And the 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 setup in the Bible is this: that the Bible says that behind the gods of the nations are actually principalities. In the Hebrew, it says, the, it gives the word shadim. It was translated into Greek. It became the word daimonia. Paul says they're worshiping the daimonia. We get the word demon from it. So there's actually spirits or real things happening. Now, when, when the gospel came into the pagan world 2,000 years ago, it drove these things out. The gods departed and the spirits departed. But Jesus gave a warning. And the warning he gave, he spoke about the man where the spirit comes out of him. And if he, he stays empty, that spirit's coming back to take over. And so this is not just about people. This is actually, a, he says, so it is with this generation, or so it will be. This is also about cultures and nations. And the warning is that any nation or civilization that has been cleansed of the gods, like the West, like America, that if it ever turns away from God, if it ever turns back from God, then these spirits will return. These ancient spirits that were cast out will return. The gods will return to repossess it. And if you want to understand what's happening in America for the last half century, it's, it's craziness and it gets crazier. It's, it is these things. It is the repossession of one, a once Christian nation. So that the dark journey is this, that when uh, Israel turned away from God, the there were three primary gods or, you know, spirits that came in, ultimately possessed it, and ultimately destroyed it. And and these same, same actual gods or really uh, demonic spirits have now come to America. Started around the time when we started turning away from God, early 60s, and you could see it like clockwork in the book. I'm not only speaking that they returned, but actually identifying them and how they're affecting our lives. So as you've kind of just done, we fast forward a few thousand years and you say that not only have they returned, but they have their hands in American culture. Explain that. Yeah. 
Well, the first one is, I'll, I'll, you know, I can only, of course, give a brief taste, Andrew, but here's a, here's a little taste of it. The first one uh, that came in Israel and actually actually changed everything was called the the Possessor. Um, he has ancient names in the book, but he actually, what, what, his, what his role for Israel and for America is to turn a nation that has known God away from God, to cause it to forget God. And so when you look at the early 60s, that's exactly what happens. And the spirit comes in, and what this, this, this God or spirit did is it started driving God and starts driving God out of the culture, out of the schools, out of the government, out of all these things. Actually, the mission is to paganize, to take a Christian nation and actually paganize it. And that's exactly what happened when you, we started taking God out. Of, it, well, the house is never going to stay empty. Others are coming in. The next one, and I'm just giving a quick overview, you know that, uh, the next one is called the Enchantress. And this is a goddess and it actually was, was through Throughout the ancient world, this is the goddess of sexual immorality. And when and when you watch you, you watch what happens in the 1960s, we start taking God out. Then comes this whole revolution in sexuality. the The aim of this principality is to take a nation, a Christian nation, and actually paganize it through sexuality to overturn it, take sex out of marriage, put it, sexualize the culture, um, actually destroy marriage because that's part of what this goddess did. Um, and so that's what we've been watching ever since, and it has not stopped. And another thing is that actually it's from this goddess in ancient times that we get pornography. She's really, she's the creator of pornography, and she seduces a nation. We're dealing with it to this day. The third one, quick overview, is called, in the book, is called The Destroyer. And this is the, the god or principality that causes a nation or causes parents to offer up their own children as sacrifices. When Israel turned away from God, this god comes comes in. We have different names, Moloch and others. The destroyer, when we turned away from God, it's like clockwork. You have one, two, three. The third part comes when we start offering up our children. 1970, abortion on demand comes to America. 1973, Roe versus Wade. So this God comes to America, and we, you know, they offered up thousands. We have offered up 63 million. This is part of the paganization of our nation. Well, and what you just said and, and how you referenced it earlier, you talked about recent Supreme Court decisions. Are there other examples? Oh, there, there, there is so much. Let, let me let me give you an example. There's one in one part of the Return of the Gods. I speak about the Transformer. This is a goddess, um, and and in the when I looked, Andrew, when I looked at the ancient inscriptions, it says it says she says she turns a man into a woman and a woman into a man. She's the goddess who blurs gender, blurs sexuality, blurs um, blurs man and woman, and changes one to the other. And it's amazing because it's exactly what as, as this progression goes it's continuing it has affected our entire our entire nation the one of the things that says that her, her ancient priests what her ancient priests did they actually dressed as women in her temple and she actually here's another thing I mean not, not only she feminized men she masculinized women we're watching that but she actually actually surgically altered or transport transitioned her priest into the opposite sex. I mean, it's mind boggling, but that's exactly what's happening. And now this principality is after our children. So here's the very headlines we're dealing with. It all goes back to this. All right, just a minute left here. Last question. You say these gods have been expelled from culture before. So how can we stand against them now? Yeah, the ultimate part of the, the return of the gods, I mean, and, and yes, you mentioned the Supreme Court, that, which is something that just happened. Actually, it has affected Supreme Court decisions. It has ordained the days they come. But we've seen, a, you know, the day I finished, Andrew, the, this book, um, it was the day that Roe versus Wade was overturned. This is about turning it back. Listen, uh, all the people, the people in the Bible, uh, Moses, Elijah, they all dealt with this. We are to be strong, but we have to know what we're fighting against. It says we war not against, against flesh and blood, but principalities. It is time to be strong strong. We can overcome this through the power of God is greater than all these things, but we have to stand. We have to be bold, not timid. You know, one of the things of the gods, they seek to have every knee bow to them. They want to cancel us. They want to, they want to silence us. We have to be strong. This is our moment, and that's why I wrote the book, so we know it, not only for each of us, but there are people in our lives as well. We're all dealing with it. It, is it could be the greatest moment, but it's the power of God. Think Elijah, and that's the key. Think Elijah, that's the key. Jonathan, you're Wisdom always shines forth when you release these books. We thank you for joining us today. You can find out more in his latest book. It's called The Return of the Gods, and it is available wherever books are sold. Jonathan, thank you for being with us today.
Thank you, Andrew. Hey, Terry, we have a uh, real quick email. Just We, uh, do. we have I'm just a few seconds out. left. I think Deanne wrote us yeah, something. Let me grab mine here. I'll read it. How about that? Okay, you. We just had a little time. She oh, said, yeah, I'm I got it. You got it? Okay, yeah. Deanne says, I'm afraid to witness to people. How do I get over that? Yeah, I wanted to mention this in just the remaining seconds we had. If you're afraid to witness to people, I don't think you have to get over it. It's a fearful thing sometimes to share the gospel, yes. right? And what does a witness do? A witness simply tells what happened. So don't wait to share your faith until you're no longer afraid. Okay, we leave you today with these words from 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one in the world. We'll see you tomorrow.